Hello, I'm Martin Chow. Welcome to today's panel discussion on whether there is a ban on the practice of Dojo Shukden. One of the biggest controversies to hit Tibetan Buddhism is the Dojo Shukden conflict. On the one side, those who worship Dojo Shukden regard it as a wrathful emanation of the Buddha of Wisdom, Manchustri. On the other side, those who oppose the practice regard Dojo Shukden to be a dark demonic force whose practice harms His Holiness the Dalai Lama and adversely affects the Tibetan people's fight to regain their country. In 1996, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, in a move said to protect the Tibetan people, advised all Shukden practitioners to stop worshipping the deity. Shukden followers say that given the Dalai Lama's position within the Tibetan community and the culture of non-opposition to him, this act is tantamount to a religious ban. Today we are joined by Pastor Kong Jin Ai and Pastor Nirol Patel and they will give us their views on today's topic on whether there is or there isn't a ban. I'll start with you Pastor Jin Ai. Is there or isn't there a ban on the practice of Dojo Shukden? And do we have any evidence whatsoever to say that such a ban exists? In short, Martin, yes, there is a ban. Since 1996, there has been a consistent and concerted effort to segregate, discriminate and marginalise Shukden practitioners. Uh, these forms of segregation have manifested as different signs and notices posted throughout the Tibetan settlements. These signs and notices can be categorised in various types. For example, posters publicising the pictures of Shukden worshippers, posters that uh, publicise their names, their contact details, uh, details about their family, details about where they live, as though there is an intent to direct some kind of action to be taken against them. There are also signs posted throughout different shops, different restaurants, which clearly state that service will be refused to Dojo Shukden practitioners. That Dojo Shukden practitioners are not allowed in these shops and premises. There are also other signs, for example, in hospitals, uh, which state that medical service will be refused to Dojo Shukden practitioners, as well as signs posted up on water tanks, for example, which state that Dojo Shukden practitioners are not welcome there. Now, why would there be a need for such signs, such obvious public signs, if there wasn't something like a ban to uphold. Could it not be that the people themselves Sorry. and not Sorry. the government, not the leadership, uh, who are actually opposed to the okay. practice? Martin, if it were the people who were opposed to the practice of Doji Shukden, then when the discussions in 1996 were held in order to ban the practice of Doji Shukden, then the people themselves would have been involved in such discussions. Having said that, these discussions did not involve members of Tibetan society. They were held solely as a closed group within certain members of the Tibetan leadership. Therefore, to say that it was the people who were actually actively against the practice of Doji Shukden would not be accurate because they themselves were not involved, they themselves were not given the opportunity to express their own personal opinions regarding this practice. Thank you, Pastor Jinai. Now, is this conflict, the problem, just contained within the Tibetan community in Dharamsala? Or is it um, much more widespread than that? It's definitely more widespread and not just contained within the Tibetan community. There are examples of Dorje Shugden practitioners being refused entry into temples in places like the UK and other places in the West. And there are cases in Southeast Asia where masters are actively promoting the ban on Dorje Shugden and refusing entry to Dorje Shugden practitioners. Thank you, Pastor. Now, have these signs, these um, negative sentiments towards Dojo Shukden and the practitioners, have they actually resulted in anything or, or are just, just merely people expressing their unhappiness towards the practice by way of signs and, and by way of um, stopping people from en entering their private premises? There have been um, instances where it has gone more than just stopping people from entering their premises. There is a real um, threat and danger to people who are practicing Dojo Shugden. So I'd just like to mention um, a friend of mine who is currently living in the United States. His family and his sister are in India and his sister is in a coma. So his sister and his family gave up the practice of Dojo Shugden so were able to receive medical treatment. Like Pastor Jinai said earlier, 
Georgia Shugden practitioners are banned from receiving medical treatment. But since they gave up the practice of Georgia Shugden, she was able to receive medical treatment in India. His family, however, have asked him not to go back to India to visit, purely because they believe that there is a very strong danger to his life. Now, you speak of dangers to, to the lives of Dodger Shugden practitioners. Are there actual examples of, of these uh, sentiments tr translating into violent activities? Yes, there is definitely a very strong threat. In late 2013, there was a lot of anti Dorje Shugden sentiment being stirred up within the Tibetan communities in India. And it was at that time that an 84-year-old monk by the name of Gen Chonze, a strong practitioner of Dorje Shugden, was brutally attacked. He is actually living in Trijang Ladrang, which is His Holiness Trijang Rinpoche's household in India, and actually served the previous Trijang Rinpoche as his assistant. Early one morning, he heard banging on the gates of the compound, and upon seeing who was at the gates, he was actually brutally assaulted by masked men. Luckily, there were dogs in the Ladrang that caused a commotion seeing Gen Chonze attacked, which alerted the other monks within the compound to wake up and come to Gen Chonze's aid. And if they hadn't done so, the injuries that he received would have been a lot worse. Thank you, Pastor. Now, so far we have spoken about a conflict, um, a problem that is within amongst Tibetans within the Tibetan settlement in India. And, but here we are in Malaysia. Have you had any personal experiences, any abuse, any criticisms, simply because you're a Dodge Shikram practitioner? Pastor Jinai? Martin, uh, it's very disappointing for me to say so, but yes, there has been personal I do have personal experience of discrimination against me simply because of my practice of Doji Shukden. I've had friends write to me telling me that uh, they like me, that uh, we've had many experiences together and they enjoy my company, but solely because I worship Doji Shukden, they no longer wish to be associated with me. This is not something that was vague, this was not a vague message to me, but it was something that was made very, very clear. That because I practice Doji Shukden, they no longer wish to be my friend. Now you have to wonder, Martin, why would someone feel compelled to write a message like that mm -hmm. if there, have not been, um, there has not been encouragement from certain parties which tell them not to associate with Dorji Shukden practitioners when there has not been messages spread throughout the Tibetan community telling them that Dorji Shukden is bad and that Dorji Shukden practitioners should be discriminated and marginalised? Why would merely practising Dorji Shukden be regarded as bad in the perception of those people who are no longer your friends? In their perception, uh, it has been said to them that to practice Dodi Shukden is to be anti-Tibetan and to practice Dodi Shukden is to be pro-Chinese. Now, they've been told that if they go along and if they associate with Dodi Shukden practitioners, that they are no longer uh, in support of the Tibetan political message, in support of the Tibetan politicians who are working for whatever cause it is that they're working for. And they've been told that as long as they continue to associate with Dodi Shukden practitioners, they are in support of anti-Tibetan activities. In other words, your practice of your faith or of Dodi Shukden that you have been doing for some time has been, has been somehow linked with politics. Yes. Because you're neither Tibetan nor, nor Chinese, you're just someone practicing your faith. Yes, and what is most disappointing is that I have many other qualities besides my practice of Dodi Shukden, as my former friends have stated. And despite all these other qualities, they are able to disregard every other quality about me, focusing solely on the fact that I practice Dodi Shukden, and therefore they no longer wish to be associated with me. Thank you, Pastor Jinai. So far we have heard of um, criticisms, uh, insults, hurled at um, practitioners. But Pastor Nirol, you are telling me that it's not limited to just normal practitioners that such a negative, um, such anger have also been directed to very high lamas. Can you tell us about that? You're absolutely right, Martin. Just take the example of my own Guru His Eminence, Sam Rinpoche, who has been the victim of a lot of abuse and negative comments online recently. These comments include um, being a demon worshipper, 
using racial insults against him, saying that he's perverting the teachings of the Buddha, and also that he is a fake tulku, a fake reincarnated master, which actually goes against the fact that he was actually recognized as a tulku by His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. Now, Sam Rinpoche has always, in my opinion, been very highly regarded, especially for his work online in spreading the Dharma. Has it always been the case that on a regular basis that he would get abuses and, and criticisms online? Actually, Martin, it was only within the last one or two months that His Eminence Sam Rinpoche has received these negative comments and this abuse online. And it was because that His Eminence had felt it was the right time to talk about his personal practice of Dorje Shugden, which he actually received in 1983, before there was any issue surrounding the practice of Dorje Shugden. So, based on what you just said, it is only because that Sam Rinpoche recently spoke about the practice of Dorje Shugden and gave his opinion about the practice that he has been attacked. Because before that, we, we never hear of any criticisms towards his very vast uh, online work that he does in the Dharma. That's absolutely correct, Martin. Now, Pastor Junai, earlier Pastor Nirel spoke about how these sentiments actually translated into actual violence. D have you heard any other examples of, of violence or where this anger has been stoked to the point where the public actually became a lynch mob? In actual fact, Martin, there has been consistent violence towards Dodi Shukdan practitioners over a a sustained period of time. For example, in 2008, the monks of Dokan Kamsin suffered a violent attack against their, against them, against their practice. Um, Dokan Kamsin is actually a fraternity house in Gandhin Shatsi Monastery, and they have always been strong practitioners, strong devotees of Dorje Shukden. Now, when the controversy came about uh, at the height of whatever anti Dorje Shukden sentiment there was at the time, the monks of Dokan Kamsin. Uh, were attacked by a mob of about 3,000 lay Tibetans as well as ordained monks and nuns who were organized uh, by local groups of people, local leadership. The monks of Dokan Kamsin were uh, about 600 strong and during this time they were actually in their prayer hall conducting Dojo Shukdan Puja to propitiate their Dharma protector. Outside, about 3,000 people had gathered where they were throwing rocks um, threatening to break through the gates into the compound of the Kangzin. And things grew to such a point where Indian police were called in, were requested to come to protect the monks from these violent people. As recently as 2014, there was a monastery in northern India by the name of Gandhin Choling Monastery that has suffered similar attacks. Gandhin Choling actually belongs to a very renowned Odishuddin practitioner by the name of His Eminence Dromo Geshe Rinpoche and up until today remains strong practitioners, strong devotees of Dorje Shukden. In 2014, Ganin Choling's caretaker passed away and before his funeral was even conducted, a mob of lay Tibetans as well as monks from a nearby non Dorje Shukden practicing monastery descended on Ganin Choling in a violent attempt to take over this monastery. Now this case resulted in the Indian police again stepping in to protect monks who had come to Gandhan Choling in order to conduct the caretaker's funeral. And to this day, the case has actually gone to the Indian courts because this takeover was not just ethically wrong, but also legally wrong. So the attack on Gen Chonze wasn't an isolated case. He was attacked because he practiced Dojo Shukdin. And now we hear from Pastor Jinai that the attack on Dokan Kangzen in 2008 was because um, it's where Dojo Shukdin monks were living. And again, in 2014, as recently as last year, that the attacks has not stopped. In fact, there's a pattern of attacking Dojo Shukden monks and, and lay people. Yes, that's correct. Earlier, both you and Pastor Nirel uh, shared with us how there were signs all over the place stopping Dojo Shukden practitioners from entering. Or rather, don't you think it's the rights of the individual shopkeepers or owners of the business to stop whoever they wish from entering? This question, Martin, can be answered in two ways. First, yes, it may be private enterprise and therefore they are well within their rights to prevent Dojo Shukden practitioners from entering. However, what these shops and restaurants and private businesses need to understand is that they exist within Indian law. They are 
guests of India, they are uh, based in India and therefore they do need to abide by Indian law. And Indian law states very clearly that everyone should have their religious freedom, that nobody should be discriminated against based on their faith. The other way that you can also answer this, Martin, is that it's on the basis of ethics. Is it ethically correct, is it morally correct to ban somebody, to deny service to somebody on the basis of their faith? Where does it stop? Where will we then start to discriminate people on the basis of their gender, on the basis of their class, on the basis of their income? Once we go down this road, Martin, it's a very, very troubling road to go down. Especially so when, when it's stopping people from receiving medical treatment purely because of their religion. Yes, that's right. Now, we've seen how um, there's this increasing sentiments against Dozier Shudan practitioners. We've seen how it's affected lay people in, in the Tibetan settlements. We've seen how it's, it has affected even monks. And you've shared how it, is, it has affected high lamas residing in Malaysia, and even you, who is not involved in any, any Tibetan uh, Chinese politics. Do you think that these, are, these sentiments are how the individual people feel about Dodger Shukran, is about how they personally feel negatively about the practice? Or do you think they have been incited to feel this way and to behave in a certain way? In other words, were they instructed to, to, to behave in a certain way? I definitely believe that it has been a directive, that it is an instruction. There is a lot of evidence to back up this assertion that it is a directive and an instruction. For example, the memo that was published by the Department of Health which stated very clearly that those who practice Doji Shukden are not allowed to hold any positions within the Department of Health. This is the department within the Tibetan government in exile. Yes, that's correct. And this memo we have seen has been translated from an official memo from the Department of Health into something as mundane, as secular as a sign above a clinic in Drepu Monastery stating that those who practice Doji Shukden are denied medical treatment. From a Buddhist perspective, this goes against every single Buddhist teaching on compassion. It is saying that it is okay for somebody to suffer sickness, to suffer pain, and to even suffer death because they practice Doji Shukden. From a secular perspective, if we examine signs like this, if we examine memos like this from the Department of Health, it is against the Hippocratic Oath. It is saying that it is okay for people, again, to be denied treatment because of their faith. The Hippocratic Oath clearly states that everybody should receive treatment regardless of their faith, regardless of their belief and their background, because it is the kind thing to do. So the incident you just told us about is not, wasn't an isolated case. Pastor Nirel was telling me how the Tibetan government in exile actually amended the constitution so that those who practice Dodge Shukden are not allowed to hold public office and positions within the civil service. That's correct, Martin. And as recently as last year, 2014, Dodi Shukden practitioners were actually labelled criminals in history. I find this very interesting, Martin, because no de democratic government in the world would label any kind of religion as being criminals in history. No government in the world would criminalise someone's personal belief and faith. I strongly believe, Martin, that there should be a clear separation between church and state. So what you're saying is that there is, in fact, institutionalised discrimination that is purposeful and ongoing. By its propaganda, the Tibetan government in exile turned Dodger Shukran practice to, to something of an act of aggression against the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan people by, in fact, officially stating that if the mere practice of this protector uh, is regarded as a crime and those who practice it are criminals in history, and it is by that uh, that the Tibetan leadership actually turned the people against those who practice Dodger Shukden. Actually, I'd just like to add to what uh, Pastor Jinao was saying, which is every government around the world should actually be looking after their citizens and after their rights, regardless of what religion they are, regardless of what race they are, regardless of any differences that they have. Every democratic country should be looking after the rights of their people. Now, this ban actually contravenes the rights of people within democratic countries 
and in fact the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states that every citizen has freedom of religion. But then there are those who say that there is freedom of religion, and Dodger Shukdan practitioners are not stopped from exercising their rights. And they point to monasteries like Shah Gandhan and Serpul Monasteries, two monasteries that practice Dodger Shukdan. They point to these two and say that, look, here's proof that Dodger Shukdan people are allowed to practice their religion, are allowed to express their, their rights, and in fact, there's no ban. Uh, because if there's such a ban, these two monasteries would not exist. Martin, I would like to strongly disagree with that statement, purely because prior to the ban, there were no such thing as Shukden monasteries. There was Ganen, Sera, Drepong, Tashi Lumpo, there were just Gelukpa monasteries. Now, overnight, all of this changed. Overnight, suddenly, monasteries became identified as Shukden practicing monasteries and non Shukden practicing monasteries. But for 400 years, Martin, Doji Shukden was relied upon by many, many attained Geluk masters. His practice was so accepted by the Geluk establishment that it's in the same way you and I would rely on Buddha Shakyamuni. It is without question, it is without second thought. It was so relied upon by all Geluk monasteries, all Geluk masters, that it was considered unremarkable. It was something that went without question. Now let's consider the example of another deity, Tara for example where Tara is universally accepted throughout all the different schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Overnight, suddenly Tara's practice is deemed evil, it's deemed bad, it's deemed spirit practice. And overnight, you have monasteries that identify as being Tara practicing monasteries and non-Tara practicing monasteries. The exact same thing happened with Doji Shukten, where for 400 years, there was strong faith, strong reliance, strong practice of Doji Shukten as an enlightened Dharma protector and then suddenly all of this changed overnight, where now you have monasteries such as Shah Ganden and Serpong, which are clearly identified as being Dorje Shukden monasteries, clearly identified as being separate to what is accepted. Notwithstanding what is just said, the fact remains that these two monasteries are allowed to be established and they are, they are allowed to operate, that they still operate today, which shows, which is proof in fact, that there is religious freedom and no ban on the practice. Martin, let me pick you up on the word allowed. The fact that a practice is allowed shows you that something can be disallowed. And the fact that it's allowed shows you that within the psyche of certain people that there is already the thought to ban a certain practice. Now, in the question of whether this practice is allowed, it is not allowed under any other legal framework other than the Indian constitution. The fact that Shah Ganden and Serpom exist and are protected and they have their religious freedom to practice whatever they wish is protected by the Indian constitution and, like I said, not under any other legal framework. So in other words, they exist in spite of a ban? In spite of the ban and despite the ban. And because um, they are protected by Indian law? Yes. Pastor Nirol, can I ask, given the severe impact all this has had on Dodge Shukdan practitioners around the world. How do you suppose that something like this could have taken root so quickly? Well, Martin, I think that from a historical perspective, within Tibetan society, there has always been a culture of non dissent and compliancy by the populace towards the Tibetan leadership. And I think we see this has carried on into the Dodge Shukdan issue as well. But you see, the, the opposition to the practice doesn't come only from the Tibetan people, but also from, from what seem to be an increasing number of people around the world. They're not Tibetans. Well, Martin, those non-Tibetan people that you're talking about that are promoting the ban on Dorje Shukden are actually doing so out of a mistaken sense of spiritual obligation they have towards those advocating the ban. However, what these people are failing to appreciate is that Dorje Shukden practitioners also have a spiritual obligation to continue their practice of Dorje Shukden following their relationship with their gurus who have given them their practice. So by making Dorje Shukden practitioners pick if they want to continue their practice or not actually confuses the guru-disciple relationships 
and brings conflict into the mind of practitioners. So what we have seen is that there is in fact a concerted, ongoing and at times violent effort to target Dojo Shukdan practitioners. That the practice has been criminalized and demonized and as a result many have turned against Shukdan practitioners. And there are very public signs in shops, hospitals, libraries, monasteries in India and Dharma centers all over the world and generally everywhere in the Tibetan exile communities that speak of discrimination against people purely because of their faith. Perhaps the most concrete evidence of there being a ban are the breakdown in relationships in Tibetan Buddhist society between different family members, between friends, and between students and teachers. Can such widespread schism and friction exist if there were no such cause? All the evidence point to there being a ban, and yet many continue to claim that there is no ban and it is just advice to stop the practice. What do you have to say about that, Pastor Jinai? What I would say about that, Martin, is that it is a, an inaccurate statement that there is clearly a ban uh, on the practice of Doji Shukden. The reason why I say this is because if it was merely advice against the practice of Doji Shukden, does advice come with consequences? Does advice come with the result of being expelled from monasteries should you not follow said advice? You know, there, has been, there have been many instances where Doji Shukden practitioners have been told if they do not wish to give up the practice of Doji Shukden, that they will be expelled from the monasteries. There has been consequences such as violent repercussions from non-Shukden practitioners towards Doji Shukden practitioners purely on the basis of their faith. You have people being denied medical treatment, being denied opportunities, being denied education, being denied service in shops for their everyday requests simply because of their faith. So if this was just advice, would such advice have such everyday consequences in every aspect of a Dojo Shukden practitioner's life? Now some people might say that um, it is advice and they truly believe that it is just advice but what I would say is that perhaps they are not aware of the historical significance of Doji Shukden's practice, that they are not aware of the timeline of events that have taken place since 1996 when Doji Shukden's practice was first said to be demon worship, to be spirit worship. What I would also add as well is that those who claim that there is no ban against Doji Shukden, that, there is, that it is just mere advice against the practice, are not aware about the sufferings of Doji Shukden practitioners on an everyday level, the kind of discrimination that they face in every single aspect of their lives, from the most mundane of decisions right up to questions that they, choices that they are forced to make about their spiritual practice. Thank you, Pastor Jinai, Pastor Norel. Whether you believe there is or there isn't a ban, it is very clear that Doji Shukden controversy has done a lot more harm than good. Many lives have been affected, and even the monastic community is divided, precisely the downfall that the Buddha warned against. The controversy has taken away from the main focus of proper Dharma practice, which is to practice with equanimity, acceptance, and compassion for all sentient beings, regardless of whether they, their personal preferences agree with ours. Dharma should not be used to express our bias and our prejudice. It should not put more separation in our thoughts between one sentient being and another. That itself is against true Dharma practice. All practicing Buddhists who wish to focus on this subject ought to do so with the intention of repairing the rift and mending broken samayas and relationships. At, accordingly, at the very least, respect Dojo Shukden's practitioners' choice in how they worship and who they choose to rely on instead of imposing our opinion on them, expecting them to conform and punishing them if they don't. In the move towards greater harmony, there is now an urgent need for dialogue between all parties and even those who have been bystanders in this controversy should now support the call for dialogue. This is one of the deepest wishes of our Guru, His Eminence Sam Rinpoche, who has nothing but the deepest respect for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. We mean no disrespect, 
to His Holiness in any way. But we humbly request that His Holiness, in His great compassion, will acknowledge and recognize the suffering of Dodger Shukden practitioners everywhere, whose only wish is to uphold commitments that have been given to them by the teachers. In light of this, we do humbly request His Holiness to allow dialogue with His representatives, as this is the best way of resolving this issue, which is hurting both sides and affecting millions of people. We wish and pray that this is soon. We wish His Holiness the Dalai Lama and all the lineage lamas of all traditions a long life, and we wish all Buddhists on both sides of the divide much peace, harmony, and a good Dharma journey. Thank you.